I put that one there for you, actually. How's everybody doing? Good to see you. Hey, let's start out with number 346, the church's one foundation. I bet you know that by heart, don't you? Father and our God, we do thank you for the church and the foundation that you have provided, and Lord, I pray that you would bless this time that we gather together, and I pray that you would accept us with, accept us as who we are, and we thank you for that, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Hymn number 554, As the Deer. As the deer. <clears throat> As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire. Oh. 
desire and I long to worship Thee. Yes. Hymn number 463, The Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, 463. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in Thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double pure, save from wrath and makes me pure. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. These are sins could not atone. Thou must save, and Thou alone. In my hand no price I bring, simply to Thy cross I cling. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, and behold Thee on Thy throne, Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Go back up towards the front of the book, number 162. Wonderful, merciful Savior. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own. Here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we pray. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Hymn number 320. Jesus, name above all names. Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Gloria 
us, Lord. Emmanuel, God is with us. Blessed Redeemer, living Word. Amen. Thank you, Clara. All righty. Well, if you guys would, open up to 2 Samuel chapter 3. Where's our pastor? Well, he's here. He's sitting right there in the back. That's good feedback already. <laughs> I, I know. 2 Samuel chapter 3. We are going to be starting in verse 12. That's where we left off last week. And my hope is to at least get through verse 21, though I have prepare through verse 27 in case I've misjudged how long this will take me because I haven't preached a Wednesday night like this style before and when you go from style to style it it just takes longer and anyway so we're going to cover the context if you remember leading up to this in chapter 1 2 Samuel chapter 1 the main dividing point between 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel is Saul is now dead right the Lord's anointed Saul has been killed and the last half of the chapter, chapter 1, is this lamenting psalm that we see from David, lamenting Saul's death. And of course, we talked about how um, notable it is that even though Saul had been pursuing David um, to try and kill David, that he still recognizes the Lord's anointing on him. And then we go on to chapter 2, and David is declared the king of Judah, but he's still not yet king over all of Israel. So we still have this division going on. And the rest of Israel is under the rule of Saul's other son, not Jonathan, because Jonathan is dead at this point, but his other son, Ishbosheth. Ishbosh Boy, I'm bad at those Hebrew names. Ishbosheth. And we see at the end of this chapter uh, an encounter at Gibeon, which is an atrocity. And they try to handle this battle by having this contest between 12 men from each side. But it leads to an even greater battle that they were expecting. And I read this in one of these commentaries. Gibeon to this day is still called Helkath Harzurim, which literally means the field of hostilities. So we see a lot of bad things resulting from this, including the death of Asael, who is Abner's brother. And that's going to come key in our text today. Asael, Abner's brother, has been killed. And then finally, we talked about last week at the beginning of chapter 3, the war is still raging between the house of David and the house of Saul, but David's house is winning. And we talked extensively about how it's wrong to have multiple wives, but David does in this text anyway. And when we get into our text today, he gets yet another wife, but that's beside the point. And at the beginning of that chapter, we see Abner, who was the commander of Saul's army, he is accused by Ishbosheth as he's accused by Ishbosheth to be um, to have laid down with Saul's concubine. Okay, he is accused of sleeping with one of Saul's concubines. Now, this is important because if Abner actually had done this, this action would have been Abner basically saying that he is the rightful king because only the king is allowed to lay with the king's concubines, who are at this point. Ritzbah, who is the concubine, would have been Ishbosheth's. But um, it appears from the text that he doesn't actually do that. And because of this accusation, we see Abner changing loyalties from previously supporting Ishbosheth to now he's going to be supporting David. So we're all cut up, right? Did I miss anything? Boy, these Old Testament narratives, the names and the connections, it's tough. Okay, we're trying to get through 12 through 21 tonight, and I've broken it down into little chunks. So I'm just going to take each little chunk until I run out of time. So let's go ahead and start at verse 12, and I'm going to read through verse 14. It says, Then Abner sent messages to David in his place, saying, Whose is the land? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring all of Israel over to you. And he said, Good, I will make a covenant with you, but I demand one thing of you, namely, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, and when you come to see me. So David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, uh, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife, Michal, to whom I was betrothed for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. 
So we see this change in loyalty in Abner, and this is this initial communication moment between Abner and David, though it's really between messengers, because I suppose you have to be careful about these kind of things. You never know what's going to happen. And you can see sort of from the text that David is not willing to easily accept Abner's loyalty, and rightfully so. I mean, so far he has no proof for it, but he asks for proof, and the proof that he asks for is quite clever, because David's goal is to unite all of Israel, ultimately. That would be the end goal of this. And we've seen from the Battle of Gibeon previously that it's definitely not going to happen militaristically. Or at least if it is happening militaristically, whichever side loses isn't going to be so happy about this uniting. So he goes about it diplomatically, and he asks for his wife, Michal. And the text reminds us that Michal is Saul's daughter, and this would further legitimize David's rule over the house of Saul. If he marries back Saul's daughter, then the house of Saul, who were the Benjamites, would have greater recognized David as their rightful ruler. Okay, does that make sense? So, by marrying back into it, it would then be his own house. Well, technically by marriage. Anyway, so we read on to verse 15, and it says, Ishbosheth. Uh, sent and took her from her husband, from Paltiel, the son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping as he went, and followed her as far as Bahurim. Then Abner said to him, Go return. And so he returned. So we see in these couple verses that Mikkel, there's a problem. Mikkel has remarried. So as we like to throw around apparently marriage debates and debates about the Torah on Wednesday nights. The question is, who is in the wrong here? David for wanting to remarry her or Mikkel for having gotten remarried? Any way in? It's, a, it's kind of a tough Torah question, but we see actually that the answer is probably neither of them. Because if we go back to 1 Samuel 25, 44, the two of them being separated is not a divorce. It's actually Saul's decision. Saul forcibly separates them and takes Michal from David and gives him to, or gives her to someone else. Usually in the Torah, and this is specifically there are marriage laws outlawed in Deuteronomy chapter 24, talking about verses 1 through 4, it's prohibited to remarry a woman that you've previously divorced. So you're not allowed to divorce someone and then change your mind and go and remarry them. So had they gotten divorced, David would be in the wrong here. Really, it's Saul's fault that they're separated, though. And if anyone is in the wrong in this particular text, it's technically Mikkel, because even though they weren't divorced, so they were technically still married, she was not supposed to have gotten remarried. That would not have been okay. She's still married to David. She's still tied to him by the law. She should not have remarried. It's understandable to see why she would have, because in this culture without a husband, you're really fending for yourself. But they were forcibly separated from each other and not divorced, so it was not within her right legally to get remarried. So when David is pursuing remarrying Mikkel, he's not breaking the law in remarrying someone he's divorced, but rather he's making the law right, pursuing his rightful wife. We're good so far? David, um, so th there's a dual action in reclaiming Mikkel. First off, like we mentioned a minute ago, this helps him diplomatically because it places him back in the position of, though through marriage, technically being in the house of Saul. And secondly, it also reinstates righteousness back into the land. So if you're going to try and win over diplomatically the other side of this war, reinstating righteousness and being in the house of your opponents, those are two good ways to start to do that. So we see a little cleverness here from David in the text. Moving on to verses 17 and 18, it says, Now Abner had consultation with the elders of Israel, saying, In times past you were seeking for David to be king over you. Now then do it, for the Lord has spoken to David, saying, By the hand of my servant David I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines, and from the hand of all their enemies. So we see Abner consulting the elders. And he, in my opinion, a little bit steps out of his 
role and says to the elders, now do it. You wanted David to be the king, so do it. Appoint him king. He's not technically supposed to do that, but that's not even his biggest mistake here, and we'll get to that in a second. But we see first Abner consults the elders. Now the elders, this is important for us to notice that he consults the elders. The elders would have been an institution older than the kings, right? So the elders were actually the ones who originally said, we want a king. And, they, and God said, no, you really don't want a king. And they decided, no, we want a king. The elders would have been the particular leaders of each tribe. And all of the 12 tribes would have had elders for their tribes. And though the king has more power than any of the elders alone, the elders within the particular tribe probably would have been more respected than the king. So if I'm a Benjamite and say my king isn't a Benjamite, which isn't a good example here, but if I'm a Benjamite, I probably ex or respect the Benjamite tribal leaders more than I do the king. The king has more power, but when you're talking about breaking it down into the actual tribes, it seems that the elders have more sway. So this would be a really key step in ensuring that David would be given rule over all Israel, garnering the support of the tribal leaders. But we see some dishonesty here. First off, he plays on their fears of Philistine invasion and their enemies when he says in verse 18, Now then do it, for the Lord has spoken to David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. So another clever diplomatic step, convincing them that there's something to be afraid of. These Philistines that have been attacking us, or these Philistines that are on the brink of attacking us, we need to be scared of them. But we look and we see that verse 18, if you really look into it, is kind of an outright lie. So he says, The Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Does anyone know who this promise is actually about? It's not about David when the promise is originally given. It's about Saul. When God says this, this is about Saul, not David. So Abner is being dishonest when he says that this promise is about David. This is a direct quote from uh, 1 Samuel 9, 16, and it's Saul. God is talking about Saul, not David. And though David is the rightful king, and he is the new appointed one now that Saul has passed away, this statement that Abner gives is never said about David, ever. It's about Saul. But the elders, apparently they don't study their Bible enough or something like that, though this wouldn't have been in the Bible at this point, obviously. But the elders don't remember this, or perhaps they just would have rather had David ruling. And there's no indication of their response in this text, whether positive or negative, but we can infer that it must be positive because it's not going to be long before David starts ruling, right? So as we move on, this is verse uh, 19. Abner also spoke in the hearing of Benjamin. So now he's meeting specifically with the Benjamite elders. And in addition, Abner went to speak in the hearing of David in Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel and to the whole house of Benjamin. Then Abner and 20 men with him came to David at Hebron, and David made a feast for Abner and the men who were with him. Abner said to David, Let me arise and go and gather all Israel to my lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you, and that you may be king over all that your soul desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went on in peace. So the reason, again, that the tribe of Benjamin is singled out here so he meets with all the elders, and then it says specifically he met with the Benjamite elders. And the reason for this is because these Benjamites would have been the most supportive tribe of Ishbosheth as king. Can anybody guess why? Why would the Benjamites have been so supportive of Ishbosheth as king? Because Saul was a Benjamite, and Ishbosheth is Saul's son. So in their eyes, at least at this point, Ishbosheth is the proper king. So it's a smart move to go and meet with the Benjamites and convince them specifically that David can be their king. In winning over the Benjamites, you win over, hopefully, the whole tribe that's most supportive of Ishbosheth's rule. 
Additionally, we see that Abner does go in peace. So before there was some tension and they're meeting just between their messengers, David's messengers meeting Abner's messengers, and now they're meeting face to face. The meeting is successful and Abner goes in peace. No matter what his motivations are, Abner at this point seems to be being honest and peaceful with David. And he seems to legitimately desire for David to reunite Israel. So we can't really see all of his motivations yet, but at least now, to David's face, he's being honest. He may have just lied to the elders, but he's being honest with David. He may have ulterior motives, and we'll get on those in a second, but in this case, he seems to be acting as a man of his word. I feel like I'm blasting through this much more than RJ, much faster than RJ. Does anybody have any comments so far? I've got more. Going to verse 22, it says, And behold, the servants of David and Joab came from a raid and brought much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he had gone in peace. And when Joab and all the army that was with them arrived, they told Joab, saying, Abner the son of Ner came to the king and has sent him away, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why have you sent him away? And he's already gone. You know, Abner the son of Ner, that he came to deceive you and to learn of your going out and coming in and find out all that you are doing. So this is supposed to be good news. Joab comes from a raid. It seems successful. You would think, oh, well, you know, we're having a good chapter so far. Abner's reuniting Israel, or at least having a hand in it, and then Joab comes back successful from a raid, and it quickly turns sour. Joab has been completely enraged at the thought of David and Abner meeting, and this is really because he has bias toward Abner. Does anybody remember why he has bias toward Abner? Yeah, he killed his brother, Asael, Abner's, or, uh, Asael, Joel's, Joab's brother, yes, Abner killed him. So Joab allows his judgment to be clouded by his desire for vengeance. And if you've studied your Bible, you know that vengeance wasn't even his to give out. But Joab assumes that Abner has come to deceive. He assumes the worst of him. He assumes that he has come to deceive you and to learn of your coming and going and to find out all that you are doing. And he allows this to cloud his judgment. Now, again, we don't exactly know Abner's motivations. We can see that it might possibly have been to gain power. It does say in verse 6 that it came that while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. So Abner does seem to be a little bit of a money or a power grabby kind of guy. So, I mean, he doesn't necessarily have the cleanest of intentions, but I don't think that that means that he has the right to kill him. He doesn't have the right to enact vengeance in this situation. It's entirely possible that the whole reason Abner is meeting with David would be in order to say that he was the one who negotiated the peace deal or to be able to tag his name onto David's when they give credit for David reuniting Israel. But to say that he lied or deceived David just really doesn't seem to be the case. Joab is just mistaken. But he allows that mistakenness to feed into an action that, I mean, obviously goes too far. We look at verse 26, and he says, When Joab came out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, and they brought him back from the well of Sirah, but David did not know it. That part is important. David didn't know it. So Abner, or Joab has just accused Abner of deception, and he's planting all these thoughts into David's head about what Abner's motives might have been. And then one verse later, Joab deceives David. He goes out, and he doesn't let David know. But we read on, and it says, So when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the middle of the gate to speak with him privately, and there he struck him in the belly so that he died on account of the blood of Asael, his brother. So he, ironically, well, I don't know if it's irony, but it makes a good story. He kills him in much the same way that his brother was killed, right through the stomach. So Joab assumes deception and then immediately uses deception in a means to take out Abner. Now, 
we have laws in the Torah, or they're not really our laws anymore, but these people would have had laws in the Torah about whether or not he could act in vengeance in this way. Does anybody know what the situation would have had to have been for Joab to be able to rightfully kill Abner? There's an allowance for it in the Torah, but it's kind of specific. So Joab is allowed to kill Abner, but only if when Abner killed Asael, he could prove that it was forethought, or he could prove that it was out of malice. He could prove that it was on purpose, and he could prove that it was because he just hated Asael. But if we go back to that story and we remember the method that Asael was killed, Asael was pursuing Abner heavily in the middle of this battle. He's pursuing him, and in a text that reads kind of weird in the English, but I'm sure it read better in the Hebrew, Abner tells him twice, stop pursuing me and turn to the left or to the right. And he doesn't stop pursuing him, and he asks him again. And finally, Abner, it says, plunges Asael with the back end of his spear. So first off, He's acting in self-defense because he's the one being pursued. And secondly, unless he's just really clever, this probably wasn't malice because he does it with the back end of his spear. So this would have been a complete act of self-defense, and the law would not have all, at all have allowed Joab to avenge his brother's death in this way. And thus we get into this long section that we're going to be getting into next week of mourning and grieving and cursing at the death of Abner. Because David is, I mean, in most texts, David is portrayed as a man of the law, and the law has been broken, and David's not going to stand for it. So what does this matter for our lives? Does anybody have any application that they think we can pull out of this section of Scripture? Vengeance isn't ours. That's a good one. That's straight from the Bible. Vengeance is not ours. It's God's. The one that I have written down, and this is kind of the application that I like to get out of most Old Testament texts, is there are pretty much no heroes in this text. right? The hero of our Bible is God. And if we're looking at any of these human beings to be the hero of the text, they're going to fail us eventually. Even David who is pretty much the only person in this text who doesn't outright sin. I mean, we know he doesn't have a spotless record either. We see Abner lies, and even though it's in order to reunite Israel, it's still a lie. And Joab murders, and even though it's in order to avenge the death of his brother, it's still a murder. And Michal commits adultery by remarrying. And even though, you know, we can discuss whether or not she even knew that she was still technically married, She is. So the only person who doesn't fall into sin in this particular chapter seems to be David. But the real point we get from it is that through all of these sins, God can somehow sew together this intricate plan that David will be king, and from his line will come King Jesus. That even amongst our sins, we are not by any means, powerful enough to get in the way of God's will being enacted. So, I like that text a lot. That was nice. We're going to go to the prayer list now. And I said this last time, I said it again. I have been at this church for four years, but there are still some of you who I don't know your name. And if I skip over your name on this prayer list, I'm sorry, but just raise your hand and make sure that I notice you. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's true. She doesn't have a say in it. And there's a couple interpretations of the text. There's some who would say, well, she's not in the wrong because she may or may not have even known if she was really divorced or not. David doesn't think he's divorced, he's treating it like he's not. There's no way to say that she knows or doesn't know, right? Exactly. Saul is the main one in the wrong. 
However, this is the part where we fall into the Torah. No matter whose part it was, it's technically still an act of adultery to be remarried if she's still married. But that doesn't change the fact that it's not her fault that she committed that sin. Does anybody need a prayer list? RJ is ready and willing to hand them out. Prayer list. I've got Barbara. Any other prayer lists? Okay, I'll just pass them around. So starting from the top, we have some good praises this week. Kay, home, Kay Webb is at home doing well, and we praise for that. And Nancy Neff is at home recovering well, and we praise for that. Um, Sandra Bird is continually healing, still at home um, after her foot surgery. And David Gray, who's usually here on Wednesdays, but understandably not, is still at home recovering from his hernia surgery, but he's doing well. Um, we want to continue praying for those people who are recently saved or looking forward to baptisms or recently baptized. Um, I have a report on the Good News Club. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for praying continually for that. We had 23 kids come last week, and it's a, it's a long story, but basically the guy, Phil Martin, who is the, he's like interim director for the state, told us, you know that you're really getting into the school well when you hit 10% of the kids. And he said, well, that you know, might take eight or nine months or even a year, but that's when you know you're getting in well. And we've hit 10% of the kids in about 10 weeks. So God has blessed us beyond all measure across us being there. We've had four different kids uh, profess claiming Jesus as their savior. We've had multiple opportunities to hand out Bibles to kids who don't have Bibles. And more than two thirds of the kids who go to Good News Club don't go to church anywhere. So this is perhaps the only Jesus that they're getting. So thank you guys for praying and thank you guys for being in support of this ministry opportunity. Keep praying for Don and Don as they, have they gone back yet? Are they still in the States? So as they get ready to go back, be praying for Don and Don that they transfer well back into their ministry. Be, be praying for Colby and his ministry. And of course, be praying for Nathan. He did a good job preaching on Sunday and we can see that God's working in his life, starting this new chapter and serving the Lord. So we want to keep praying for him. Um, I guess we're pretty close on our associate pastor. It's getting closer and closer every day at the very least. So continue praying for those people who have to um, help make that decision and be praying for our future associate pastor. Um, there is a man out there who God has already ordained to fill that position. So we want to be praying for him. Well, there was a long list of expecting babies and now... There's one. So, you got to catch up, Clara. You doing okay? Not too, yeah, not too fast, yeah. You guys doing okay? Good, good to hear. Yeah. Baby Hassan. Boy, that kid's going to get bullied a lot if they're named Baby. That's all I'm saying. As it comes to my mind, she's on the list surely somewhere, but continue praying for Ruth. Um, Obviously, I saw we're praying for Ruth's brother and sister-in-law, but continue praying for Mike and Ruth as well. Um, continue praying for those who are in mourning over lost family members, especially the Wilson family and the Hudson family, um, both um, losing mothers who had huge impacts in their lives. So we know how hard that loss can be. So be praying for them to have peace. Um, Continue praying for Mary Needham. I talk to Paul about her sometimes, and um, she's doing well, but tired and stressed all the time because Mary's just a worker and doesn't know how to let other people help her mother sometimes. So, But just be praying for Mary and be praying for her mother. Again, I don't see David Gray here. He's not here tonight, but um, we'll continue praying for this father. I'm not sure which Paula is on A. Is that a Lauderdale or... Okay. Not Beth, Betty? Okay. I don't have a pen up here. Um, okay. And how is she doing? Okay. Well, we'll continue praying. Absolutely. It's a good thing to have that hope, to know that, you know, we don't face it in the same way that the world faces it. Okay. Alrighty. Absolutely. Barbara, how is your... Okay. But 
they're getting ready to set up that scope, I guess. Okay. All right. I don't see Linda Rudd here. Catherine's here, though. Right? I thought I saw Catherine. Hey, Catherine. Catherine, how is your friend's son? Yeah. Okay. Do you know when or where? Okay. Alrighty. Okay, well, we'll be praying. I guess that puts you guys on the ball to pray all day tomorrow. So be praying continually for it like we're supposed to always. Okay. All righty. We will continue praying for your brother, for Terry. James, how is your sister doing? Okay. Now, is there somebody who's able to help care for her or? Good. Okay. Good. I don't see Dr. Mace's face here, but um, do you guys know anything about any updates on her parents? Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We'll continue praying for God's provision for them. Julie, how's your mother? Absolutely. Well, we'll be praying continually for her, and we'll be praying for you as you go to help serve. Uh, let's see. Amanda, how's your dad? Okay. Is he still refusing? Okay. Yeah, that's hard to accept. I didn't see the the whites here tonight, but we heard from them this week. Um, she's having chemo once every three weeks, and um, the treatments have been making her weak, so it makes her harder, makes it harder for both of them to get in. And of course, um, James, 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 James White. That's not his name. Kenneth. Where did I get James? Kenneth White. <coughs> Of course, he also has cancer, so be praying for both of them, especially with Kenneth caring for Helen when he's not exactly in the best of health himself. Jimmy, how is your nephew? Now it's, it is your nephew. Okay. So just be praying for that provision. Absolutely. We'll continue praying. I see it again. Continue praying for Ruth. Continue praying for Mike as he helps care for Ruth. That was about Miss Ruth. Is he? Her brother's here. No, they're all at a dinner. Yeah. Okay. 
continue praying for Amelia. They have an EEG that makes that Friday. The 19th is Friday, so pray for her this week. Um, don't see the DOSs here, but of course he has still that cataract surgery coming up. Steve, how are you doing? Waiting to schedule it? Okay. Chris, how's your friend? He is a Christian, obviously, or he wouldn't be sharing the gospel. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. That reminds me, they, most of them aren't homeless, though there are homeless children, and we need to pray for homeless children too, because that's just an awful thing. But we are having um, Horace Mann, they are having a scarf drive come December. So um, be thinking about that as that comes closer. We are going to continue aiding them as we do often and hopefully get those kids a lot of scarves. The winter's coming up and some of those kids will have it rough if they don't have the helping hand, so. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's that season where we should be giving more. So. Um. Well, thank you all for those wonderful reminders to be thinking not only of people within our congregation, but people outside our walls as well. Paula? Yeah. Yeah, she's the one that's on the billboards, right? keep praying. And of course she has two little sons, so be praying for them too. Steve? Has anybody heard any updates on Sandra and Frank? Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you, Steve, for mentioning Chrissy. Of course, Chrissy had that um, MRI on her back and her hip. And RJ, have you got any results back on that yet? Okay. 
and she was bragging to me on Sunday about her new mattress. That's how you know you've got hard back troubles when you're bragging about a new mattress. So I'll be praying for her. Absolutely. Jimmy? Um, uh, I used to go to church at Carrington. Yeah. I just moved to go to um, Holy, and it's kind of up in the air right now. No issues with me, just wanting mercy. And the Lord really blessed my child greatly. Mm -hmm. And we all went through this big hickory that we had to go to our church to get this. Right. She's trying to play volleyball in college. Volleyball, I do go on and walk and then she does. Yeah. But um, anyway, then I have my best friend. Her name is Gina Austin. Mm -hmm. um, G I N A Austin. And uh, she just happens to be our breast cancer. She's a former teacher. And she's also a severe diabetic. So everything's taking a toll on her right now. So just pray for her on her time that she needs. Absolutely. Any others? James, I met with him today. He is out of the hospital. He's doing fine. He kind of talked tongue in cheek about his recent stay, too, so he's doing okay. Yes. Have you gotten to visit him recently, your dad? Yeah, we drive there. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll be praying for you with that appointment coming up, and we'll be praying for you, especially when you have to support from that long distance. It's hard. So we'll keep you guys in our prayers. Any others? We could pray all night. I don't mind. Alrighty. Well, we can start handing out some of these mics. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Why don't we get one to Ronald and one to Larry and he can just close. And we'll do in that order. We've got a lot of people struggling and a lot of people being supportive in other people's struggles. And I think it's important to remember that when we do have that supporting role or when we are struggling ourselves that ultimately we can't do it on our own and that our rock and our salvation is Jesus Christ. Um, and I thank you guys for being a church that prays and a church that lifts one another up um, in that spirit of Jesus first lifting us up. It means a lot. So, Ronald, if you'll pray, and then Larry can close us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day, uh, a beautiful day, even though there was hardship for families. The Wilsons, they had two funerals today, and lots of friends, relatives, and just it was good to see so many people turn out because she's such a wonderful woman and a mother and lived 92 years which was good and, and her grandson spoke and he's a preacher I think he's in Arkansas but he had a wonderful uh, obituary part of the service and uh, it was good 
I'd heard a lot about her relatives, like her son, Barbara's brother, but I'd never met him, and I met him today, and we've been praying for him in our men's group for I don't know how many years. Uh, and he was pretty well dependent on his mother for everything. And now she's gone. I wonder what he's going to do. We need to pray for him. I think his name's Larry. And pray for me. Well, just pray for me. I pray these things in Jesus' name. list just goes on and on and Lord it just uh, no way that we can really take it all in but yet we know we're praying to a heavenly father that knows all Lord and, and you know each and every family and each and every heartache and Lord you know uh, all the families that have lost loved ones here recently Lord and you know, we just lift them up to you in a special way Lord because there now is a, a hole in their family that will never be replaced and so just give them your your strength and, and your comfort Lord that only you can give all of these Lord that are going through surgeries and tests and, and now trying to recover and, and all these different things Lord that we've mentioned here tonight you're aware of every single one of them and Lord we just thank you for the way that you answer prayers we do pray that your will will be done in each and every one of them Lord Knowing that you love us, knowing that you love us so much that you sent your son to die for our sins. And we just thank you and praise you for that, Lord. And as we leave here tonight, help us to share that good news with the lost world, Lord. We can get so discouraged listening to what's going on around us, Lord. But yet, we know there's hope. And that hope is in you. And we thank you and praise you for it. Now, guide and direct us, Lord, in all that we do and say. We pray that it will be pleasing unto you that it will glorify your name. In thy holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All righty, thank you guys for coming. And I skipped over those announcements, but don't forget, Sunday night we'll be having Thanksgiving, and there's still that sign-up sheet for bringing desserts. We hope you come and bring one. Thank you guys.